Good morning, everyone. Uh, let me add my, uh, my welcome to, to one you've already received from Marcus um, and Thelma. Um, thank you so much for the update there, Thelma. It's great to hear what's going on um, with Pastor Jacob and the ministry there in India. Um, today's reading is from Esther 2. It's the whole chapter. Uh, and so I can't claim to be as good with the names as Steph was last week, but I'll give it a good go. Uh, so we're going into Esther 2. If you have your Bibles, please do follow along. It helps an awful lot. Um, Esther chapter 2. After these things, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had abated, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's young men who attended him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins at the harem in Susa, the citadel, under custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the young woman. Let their cosmetics be given them, and let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This pleased the king, and he did so. Now there was a Jew in Susa, the citadel, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jahar son of Shimei, son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives, carried away with Jeconia, the king of Judah, who Nebuchadnezzar, king of the captives, carried away, oh, sorry, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, who carried away. He was bringing up Hadasha, who, that is Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at, and when her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susa, the citadel, in custody of Haggai, Esther also has take, was taken into the king's palace and put into custody of Haggai, who had charge of the young, young woman. And the young woman pleased him and won, fa won his fa favor. And he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and her portion of food, and with seven chosen young women, from the king's palace and advanced her and her young woman to the best place in the harem. Esther had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. And every day Mordecai walked in, in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and what was happening to her. Now when the turn came for each young woman to go into the king Hasiaris, after being 12 months under the regulations for the woman, since this was the regular period for their beautifying, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with spices and ointments for women. For, for women. And when the young woman went into the king in this way, she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the, the harem to the king's palace. In the evening, she, she would go in, and in the morning, she would return to the second harem in custody of Shazgaz, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the concubines. She would not go into the king again unless the king delighted in her and she was summoned by name. When the turn came to, for Esther, the daughter of Ahibel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had get, taken her as his own daughter to go into the king, she asked for nothing except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who had charge of the woman, advised. Now Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her, and when Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the 10th month, which is the month of Tebeth, the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the women, and she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. But the king gave a great feast for all his officials and servants. It was Esther's feast. He also granted a remission of taxes to the provinces and gave, her, gave gifts uh, with royal generosity. Now when the virgins were gathered together the second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Esther had not made known her kindred or her people as Mordecai had commanded her. For Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she was brought up by him. In those days, as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthan and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, who guarded the threshold, became angry and sought to lay hand on King Ahasuerus. And this came to the knowledge of Mordecai, and he told it to Queen Esther, and Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. When the affair was investigated and found to be so, the men, who both hanged, uh, the men were both hanged on the gallows, and it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. This is God's 
word. Let's just pray before John comes um, to speak. God, we thank you, Lord, that you are Lord of Lords, King of Kings, that you are the creator of the heavens and the earth, and that we are your subjects. We thank you, Lord, that you control the winds, the seas, and all that is in with, within the earth, including the world's leaders uh, and everything that is happening in this world. And we do think this morning of those areas of the world where there is conflict, where there is war, and we pray, Lord, that you would have your hand in those places, that you would bring peace to those lands. We think of Ukraine, we think of Israel and Gaza, we think of the many unheard of disputes in the continent of Africa, Lord. We pray that your hand would be there, Lord, that you would uh, bring peace. We pray for um, just our lands here as well, Lord. We pray that um, you would uh, be with our political leaders, Lord, that you would have your way with them, that uh, you would grant them wisdom. Uh, and we pray, Lord, that we would, um, you would give them wisdom in their choices, Lord, uh, to rule well. And we pray uh, for your church as well this morning. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you have brought us together as a church family uh, under your headship. Um, and we acknowledge, Lord, that there is many within our congregation that are um, suffering with grief, with um, anxiety, with distress, Lord. And I do thank you, Lord, that we are a church family, Lord. And I pray that you would give us the ability to uh, see the brokenhearted within us. And that you would, uh, you would uh, in your mercy and your love, provide uh, care and support in times of grief and pain. We thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you that it, is, uh, it proclaims your truth, it proclaims your character uh, as uh, your word, and that we can rely on it, Lord. And so I pray this morning that as we delve into it, that you would um, grant not only John, but the leaders in uh, our children's spaces the, the wisdom to, to teach it well, Lord, uh, to bring your truths uh, to our ears, Lord. And I pray that as we receive, uh, give us ears that are prone to listen, uh, prone to learn from you, and to give you glory in all we do. Amen. Amen. Thanks, John. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are in chapter two today, as John has just read for us, of Esther in our new series. Uh, and I want to begin by saying this as we jump into Esther chapter two. There are two ways uh, to interpret and to read chapter 2. The two ways to interpret and to read chapter 2. One is right and one is very wrong. Uh, and in your pre-reading this week, I'm sure you've all read Esther chapter 2 in preparation for this morning, uh, I wonder which way you read it. Let me give you the two ways and then I'll tell you which one's right and which one's wrong. One way is this. Esther chapter 2 is the Bible's and the Old Testament's Cinderella story. It's a romantic drama in which uh, the princess would, be, would, would find her way into the palace. It features a beauty, and it features this like type beauty pageant. Uh, the church girl wins uh, as she impresses everybody with her winning smile, and she makes her way to the palace. What an example Esther is for all of our little girls to have uh, as they go about their business and they want, want to follow. That's the wrong way. Just so you, you maybe caught the sarcasm in the tone, but, but that's the wrong way to read Esther chapter 2. When it's read that way and interpreted that way, that is one of the worst abuses of Scripture that is ever known to man. And it is done by well-meaning, many well-meaning contemporary Bible readers all over the place. Instead of that, Esther chapter 2 is actually full, far from flowing with romance and, and, and that sort of thing. It is full of moral ambiguity and spiritual compromise. 
moral ambiguity and spiritual compromise mark Esther chapter 2. And instead of reading it that first way, where, where, where Esther chapter 2 is the Cinderella story, the right way to read Esther chapter 2 is this. Instead of offering us a, a, an example to follow, Esther chapter 2 invites us to face the reality of what life was like in Persia at the time. A life in which women were objectified and made victim and abducted where men were predators and where it for at least some fear was far more great than faith. Esther chapter 2 is not the Old Testament's version of Persia's Got Talent. It is a harsh reality glimpse into the life of what it was like in, in Persia. Dark, uncomfortable, a story of abduction and of abuse, in fact. Again, from last Sunday, it is one of those chapters where you read it and you should go, and I'm go if you don't know what I'm talking about today, I will endeavor to enlighten you this afternoon on coming up at Cornerstone, the WhatsApp chat, but it is one of those, oh, brother, oh. See, some of you have no clue what that means. Some of you do, and I will enlighten you afterwards uh, after the sermon today. Uh, but it is. It, it should make us go, what, what is this? Instead of thinking, oh, Esther, she's going to make it into the key. Oh, look at her. Way. No. It is a story of abduction and of, of abuse. And yet, in the midst of all of that, in the midst of all the, um, the, the moral ambiguities, and the shocking abuse that happens, what we're, what we're invited into is tracing God's footprints and God's foot, or fingerprints all over this story. Even through all of that, we're, that's what we're invited to do. We're invited to look for God in all the details. Because God is working in this story despite the sin Despite the suffering, we find him working for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. That's what we find. And Esther chapter 2 does not flinch from showing us the simple, ugly facts of the story. Where people are treated as commodities. And as I say, far from a fairy tale story of a young Jewish girl falling in love with Prince Charming, Esther chapter 2 is one where we, we could easily hear about it on the news. Esther chapter 2 is real world. And folks, that should be really encouraging for us, actually. That should be really encouraging for us because God and how he has revealed to reveal himself through his word, has not tried to clean it up. He's not tried to make it, you know, this nice little fit in a box, and you can do the two plus two equals four. No, because he knows life's not like that. Life is messy. Life is all over the place. It's often unpleasant. It's often difficult. And yet, in the unpleasantness and in the difficulty, God is working. God is moving. And that's what he wants us to see. Now, the first thing we notice here in Esther chapter 2 is this. We need to look at the language that is used here very, very specifically. After these things, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had abated, he remembered Vashti. He remembered Vashti. Back at the end of chapter 1, you'll remember King Ahasuerus, drunk and enraged, when, when King or Queen Vashti refused to come to him, he makes this decree, he makes this edict. And chapter 2 opens sometimes later, sometime later where, where the king's anger has abated somewhat and he's forgotten that what has happened. And we're told he remembered Vashti. Now that, that language there is very important. The language used there in the Old Testament is often used of God remembering his people. So the king remembered 
Vashti. And in the Old Testament, where, where that language is used of God, it is often used where he remembers his people and his anger abates and he withholds wrath. Now, if that's the same language used here where the king remembers Vashti and the decree that was made against her, it is certainly laced with regret. It is certainly laced with regret. He remembers her. He remembers she wasn't as bad as he thought she was when he was full and he was angry and he is filled with regret. The lesson here, folks, is very simple. Decisions made in anger often lead to regret and decisions made in drunken anger definitely lead to regret. Proverbs 20 verse 1 says this, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. And that's exactly what has happened here with the king. He has been led astray by one, his anger, and two, by alcohol. And he has made decisions in those moments where he's angry and he's enraged that he now regrets. And so he calls his advisors, these wise people who he has around him, the yes men that we talked about last week, in verse 2. And the search begins almost immediately. The search begins for Vashti's replacement. The search is undertaken for the most beautiful woman in the country to be brought to him and, and basically to restock the, the king's harem. That's what's going on here. We need to look at it like that. We can't gloss over it. We can't tidy it up any. We can't clean it up any. That's what's happening. He remembered her. He regretted everything that he had done, but then he moves on quickly to distract himself from the regret that is, that is in his mind. Folks, how often is that the case with a human heart? Whatever regret the king has been feeling for Vashti is now forgotten very, very quickly uh, as this new batch of women are going to be paraded in front of him. This new distraction. And folks, that's, that's actually a, a classic human heart strategy to, to, to deal with regret and remorse. And especially of the unrepentant heart. You see, unbelieving hearts can only avoid guilt and regret. Unrepentant hearts can only try to cover it up. And what they do, unrepentant hearts, what they do is they find, try to find distractions to do that. They can't remove the guilt. They, they, all they can do is hide it under a blanket of, of indulgence. The unrepentant heart, when faced with life's consequences for decisions made, can only avoid. It can never claim. Now, you and I both know what can claim. You and I both know for the believing heart what can claim. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And there's a couple of quick points of application here I want to make. I would say, without doubt, there are folk in here this morning that there are things in your past you wish you hadn't done. Whether recent or further back. There are things you've done, there's things you've thought, the things you've said that you wish you hadn't done, and there is regret and there is remorse. The good news of the gospel is this. You don't need to carry that. You don't need to carry that. You can be cleansed. Trust in the cleansing blood of Jesus 
for the forgiveness of your sin. So if you're sitting here this morning and you're a believer and you're feeling regret and you're feeling remorse for things that have happened in the past, you don't need to. Is it good to acknowledge mistakes? Is it good to acknowledge things that we've done wrong in the past? Absolutely. But you don't need to carry it like a weight around your neck. What does the Bible tell us? That, that God has removed our sin from us. He has made us whiter than snow. And so this morning, just trust the gospel. Trust in the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus. That's what we need to do. And let the remorse go and let the regret go and move on. Move on. You are paralyzing yourself. You don't need to carry that. You can be free from it. Confess it to God. Repent of it. Move on. You don't need to let it cripple you today. The sins of yesterday do not need to paralyze you today and tomorrow. But a point of challenge. Are you using the same strategy that the king used here? Distraction. Just find the something else. You can see how quickly he moved from conviction and feeling regret and remorse to distraction. Just find a new thing. Is that you? Is that what you're doing? Are you bouncing around from one thing to another just to cover over all that, that's going on? Stop. Run to Jesus. Stop. Turn to Jesus. That's what we see here in this opening verse. And then what we have is the curtain falls in this opening scene of chapter 2. It, it, it opens very quickly on a, on a different scene altogether. And what we're confronted with and what we face is a, as, a, as a Jewish, small Jewish family living where they were exiled to. And what we find here, this is around 538 B.C., uh, most of the Jewish community who were exiled have returned to Jerusalem and to Israel. Uh, but, but obviously Mordecai and his family have not. They have done what we're told Jeremiah the prophet told the people, the God's people to do. Let me read it for you. They, they're doing what they were told to do. Jeremiah 29, 4-7 says this, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare you will have welfare. Mordecai and his family had settled down. They had done exactly what Jeremiah had told them to do. They were in exile. They were far from home, but they had settled down. They had built houses. They had planted gardens. They had taken wives. They had started families. They were seeking the welfare of the city. They were doing all that they had been asked to do. But no doubt this family had, we, we can read it very clearly here, this family had known uh, tragedy. They, 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 they knew what it was like to face grief and loss. And so there was a Jew in Susa, the citadel, whose name was Mordecai, who had been exiled from Jerusalem. They are strangers in a strange land. They belong to the people of God. And whilst that changes everything, they're still in a strange land. They're far from home. They've been cut off from the, the covenant promise of worship. They, they're there. They're trying their best. And the author, whether it's Mordecai or not, as he introduces this small family, the intent behind the introduction is this. Keep an eye on this family. God is not done with His people. Keep an eye on this small, messed up family that has known tragedy, known loss, because God is not done with His people. And verse 1 to 4 gives us some insight into the 
just immoral brutality of what life was like in Persia back in the day. And then in 5 and 7, we have a very different picture. We see a covenant family struggling to survive. By all appearances, they have assimilated into the, cult, the culture very, very well. Mordecai actually is a pagan name, which means man of Murdoch. Murdoch was one of the Babylonian pantheons back in the day. Similar, we, have, we find Esther here to have two names. I don't know if you noticed that in the reading or have noticed that when you've been reading at home. Her Hebrew name is Hadassah, and her pagan name is Esther. She has been orphaned at some point. She's been adopted by Mordecai. Mordecai has taken her on as her own. And he seems to have been, and this is important for the story, he seems to have been totally devoted to her. He loved this child as his own. This is a household that has known tragedy, has known loss. He has loved this child. He's taken her in to be his own. And here they are in a strange land trying to accommodate to culture. And what we see in both their names, their Hebrew name and their pagan name, is the challenge that God's people has faced throughout all of time. Where does she really belong? It's almost as if she's living in two worlds. There are two Esthers. There's Hadassah, the child of the covenant, citizen of the kingdom of God, and then there's Esther, the pretty Persian girl, who's about to be swept into this whirlwind of a story. How do they relate to one another? How can they be reconciled? Folks, that's a dilemma that every child of the covenant faces today. That's a dilemma that you face every single day. As Christians, we're called to live in and be in the world but we are called not to be of the world. But the reality is many of us have two identities. Just as Esther had. The reality is that many of us live double lives, in fact. The reality is that, that when you're in here on Sunday, you're all nice and clean and smiley and happy and churchy and religious and whatever. And on Tuesday afternoon in your workplace when people are annoying you and, 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 and maybe even pressing you on your faith, you're nowhere to be seen. We live double lives, uncertain how to know, uncertain to know how to bridge the gap between the two. And you, and you face it way more than I do. I've said this often, you face it a whole lot more than I do, working in secular environments, being, being out there every day, working in the environments you're in, you face it a whole lot more than I do. And you know that there is social risk attached to being a follower of Jesus. You know that. You know that if you say that you're a follower, all-in follower of Jesus, and, and, and say that you're, you're following Him, then there is social risk attached to that. You're going to be thought of as a weirdo even more so than you are already, let me tell you. Uh, you're going to be thought of as strange. You might be ostracized. You might be left out of things. You might be whatever, whatever, whatever. But you're living a double life. And Jesus was very clear about this, folks. If you deny me, if you deny me, I will certainly deny you. He's very clear. We feel the powerful pressure to conform to the pattern of the world, as I'm sure Esther and Mordecai did as well. And they don't stand up to the test. 
Do you see what I said about the Bible being real? Mordecai has told Esther what? Hush down on the Jewish stuff. Don't let on. Don't tell them where you're from. Don't tell them your background. This is an abject failure. Let's make no bones about it. And we are tempted to do the same. But even knowing that, that both the hero and the heroine, Mordecai and Esther, of the book of Esther, face the same dilemmas that we face. Surely we're sitting in here this morning and we're, we're realizing that, that God then is not indifferent to this. He knows this. He knows these are the challenges that we face. That's why it's here. He knows that's what you're going through on a daily basis. So be encouraged by that. Be encouraged that God knows. But know this, God is no one's debtor. And the Bible tells us that those who honor him, he will honor them. Those who honor him, he will honor them. So we move on to what can only be described as this, the abduction of Esther. The abduction of Esther. And I know that might sound harsh, but it's, but it's the reality. What we see here is the mighty powerful hand of the Persian Empire swing into action. Uh, Esther's life is about to change forever. Susa, the, the citadel Susa, is now packed with, with young women who have been gathered from across the empire, placed under Haggai's care, all of them about to compete for this, this queen's position, and they're all there. It's not a voluntary thing, by the way. Let's not get this wrong. They didn't fill in the application. They didn't go online and, and do the thing. Put a photograph, put, put your best photograph on like we do on Facebook. You know that one? Uh, they didn't do the thing. They have been abducted. Taken away from their homes, taken away from their families, placed in a harem. It's brutal. Taken into the king's palace. Her life and the lives of those other young women have been completely disrupted. And it's only going in one direction. But it's not long before Esther finds favor in the, in the sight of Haggai. She begins to receive these privileged, uh, this privileged status and benefits uh, that she, she did here in, in chapter 2. Esther eventually wins the throne. Uh, and let, let's, make no, let's make no mistake about this. Because the Bible doesn't. Esther wins the competition because of what happened on the night that she spent with the king. Esther wins the competition because of what happened on the night that she spent with the king. Some people, in their wisdom, have tried to tidy this up. They've tried to clean it up. And they've tried to say, well, 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 nothing actually happened that night. Esther was a good Jewish girl. Nothing happened. There is no evidence of that in the text whatsoever. None. And so what we don't need to do is try to amend it or t clean up the text. We don't, we don't scold Esther for what she does. We don't, we don't ridicule her for what she does, but we certainly don't clean it up. We don't amend the text. Rather, what we do, what we need to do, is read these words with grief and empathy for this young woman. It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. Recognizing that this story is not a fairy tale story. And recognizing, folks, that this happens today. 
We look back at this and think, That's, this is antiquated, it's old, it's so far back, 585 BC. Oh, that, they, they, were just un, they just didn't know what they were doing. This is happening now in our world. Where young women are abducted from their homes, taken into slavery, sold, used, and abused. How, how corrupt is the human heart? How dark is the human heart when these things are still happening? But as we take all this in, the ugliness and the pain, I want you to imagine this for a second. Imagine being Mordecai. Just imagine being Mordecai for a second. This young girl that you have loved as your own has been brutally taken, abducted, basically sold into sex slavery in front of your eyes. The Bible is not a sanitary book, it's very real. It's very real. But this must have been heartbreaking for Mordecai. See, this, this begs us to face the question, how does God build his kingdom in a world as dark as this one? How does God build his kingdom in a world as dark as this one? I think there's a couple of answers. The reality is this, God makes even his enemies serve his purpose. God makes even his enemies serve his purposes. This is the first way we find here God building his kingdom. Even his enemies, he uses even his enemies to serve his ends. He uses wicked men and sinful deeds and he thwarts their evil design and, and bends them and makes them conform to his own purposes. You, you don't have to look too far through Scripture to see the reality of this. Think about Joseph. Think about the, the evil intent of his brothers. And when Joseph, I, I've, I've quoted this before, when Joseph meets those brothers, he says what? You intended it for evil, God intended it for good. We move into the New Testament. We see through the Gospels all the story around, surrounding Jesus. Think of all the elements that are there. Think of all the people that are involved. Think of Judas. Think of Pilate. Think of all those involved in that story, all the evil involved in the story leading to the cross. What is God doing? God is fulfilling His purposes through it all. He even uses his enemies to do so. We see that as clear as day throughout Scripture. God even makes his enemies serve his purposes. That's one answer to how God builds his kingdom even in a, a world as dark as this. The second answer is this, and I think this is the one where we need to focus on, and this is the one where we need to take encouragement from, folks. God uses his weakest servants for his greatest works. God uses his weakest servants for his greatest works. Notice that at the heart of God's design, at the heart of the message of this chapter, stands Esther. Our focus and our attention as we finish out the chapter is not on King Ahasuerus. It's not on the evil that is being perpetrated. It is on this young, our attention and our eyes are fixed on this young Jewish girl, broken as she is. The author here has, has fixed our eyes on Esther. 
In verse 1 to 4, we see how this, that the power of the Persian uh, empire swings into display. And then the rest of the chapter, there's just a, a, a shift in focus. Here we have Esther and Mordecai with a broken, tragic home. Struggling to find a way in a strange land, struggling to make ends meet, struggling in every single way. And it's a study here, folks, in contrast. On one hand, we have this broken family uh, trying to find its way through. We have then, on the other hand, King Ahasuerus with all the power and all the wealth and all the, whatever, the glory of the, the Persian Empire. And, and, and who is God going to use to build his kingdom? Which one? The broken and the messed up and the barely making it through? Or this glorious king who has all the power and all the wealth and all the influence and all? Which one? There's only one. He's going to use Esther and he's going to use Mordecai. This is how the kingdom is built, folks. This is a really important kingdom principle. Really important. This is how the kingdom is built. It is not built by the mighty and the noble and the strong. It is built by the weak. I don't know about you this morning. Maybe you're feeling strong, are you? Maybe you're feeling all mighty and noble of yourself. The reality is, in here, I'm guessing there's not too many of us feeling like that this morning. And what you need to hear this morning is that God builds His kingdom through the weak things of this world. Not by the mighty, not by the noble, not by the strong, not by the Ahasuerus of this world, not by power, not by might, by what? The weak things. Not by the influential, not by the impressive but through the weak things. God used an abused, outcast girl hiding her Judaism for fear to build His kingdom. It is the weak things. The things that are not that God uses to shame the wise to bring nothing to things that are. Folks, we are often tempted to think, we can be often tempted to think that the kingdom of God advances because we might be able. We might be able to do it. Might, we might be able to bankroll it. Well, if we could just fire money at it, then, then, oh, would you stop? The things we could do If we could just get a, a good sponsor to, for, for the kingdom's causes, then, then, then everything would go well. If we're, if we're just, have, right, we'll do a bit of political maneuvering. And if we do a bit of political maneuvering and we get in with power, then things will go well with the kingdom. Where on earth would we find that in the Bible? Nowhere. Nowhere. It is an object weakness and brokenness where God builds His kingdom. As I finish, and as I use those words, object weakness and brokenness, does it remind you of anyone? And when we think of building the kingdom of God, where should we look? To our Savior who was made weak and who was broken. Jesus didn't inaugurate this kingdom through power and stature and influence and wealth. So that's not how it's going to be built. He initiated and inaugurated the kingdom through weakness, brokenness, 
openness, almost a weakness. That's how the kingdom is built. Jesus reminds us, as we look to him this morning, we're saved by a cross. We're saved by a cross. The ultimate display of humility and brokenness. If we're going to follow him, our lives must be marked, must be marked by the cross, not by power, not by strength, not by might, but by the cross. Let me pray. Father.